Well, I think just to go back to how you started this, you're not an expert and we are. Anyone who says they're an expert in AI now is full of shit. Hope everyone had a great day. For starters, as always, Aaron, the whole team, thank you. Thank you very much. This is just a wonderful, amazing event that you produce for the state. It really is just quite amazing. So as she said, I'm a partner at DLA Piper. I am the chair of the corporate practice in the Short Hills, New Jersey office. I focus on venture and primarily M&A activities for startup companies. Um, what I'm not an expert in is AI. That's why these two gentlemen are on the stage right now, so they can talk about AI. So hopefully we'll get a bunch of uh, your, your questions answered, some things you, you want to learn more about. We have plenty to talk about that we've walked through already, but we'll give a couple minutes at the end to open it up to the floor. So let's start with intros. Steve? Well, first of all, I feel like Mariana Rivera because I was asked to like come in and pinch hit and close here. Uh, uh, last minute, last uh, the other speaker unfortunately was was sick, so um, so I get to do back to back. Um, uh, so I'm Stephen Rosenblatt. I uh, co-founded an early stage venture firm called Oceans. We invest um, at really the earliest stages of companies. So when they're forming to you know uh, early early revenue, um, tech at the core companies. Uh, we've now made over 55 investments, and prior to starting Oceans, I had run a number of different and built a number of different tech companies over the last 20 years. Um, most recently, I'd been president of Foursquare. You guys know Foursquare. And then prior to that, in the mo last kind of wave, um, helped build a mobile company that we sold to Apple. So, uh, and a proud, born and raised in New Jersey in Bergen County, and now living in New Jersey. So, very nice. Thank you. Ram? Uh, I'm Ram McKellar. I'm the Executive Vice President for Innovation Impact at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. A fancy title, but they've thrown everything else that people don't want under my direction. Uh, it's covering venture, uh, investing, uh, a lot of venture debt programs, uh, various a portfolio of programs to support companies from ideation post-growth, uh, we also have a, a, a entire department running clean energy products to meet the state's climate change goals. And I also head up the Strategic Innovation Center Investments. And in fact, one of them is right back there, the NJ FAST, which stands for New Jersey FinTech InsureTech Accelerator at Stevens. That was a partnership between the EDA, Prudential, and uh, uh, Stevens Institute. So glad to be here. Very nice. Thank you, gentlemen. So we're going to walk through a number of different topics. The title of the presentation is The AI We're Avoiding. Now, we can take that in a number of different directions, and we will. But I think to start, it'd be helpful to understand where you two are coming from. So let's start with, at a very high level, what are your views on AI, and what are you focusing on within AI? Well, I think, just to go back to how you started this, you're not an expert and we are. Anyone who says they're an expert in AI now is full of shit. So um, I think we spend our time in AI, but I, I don't think anyone's an expert yet because we're, we're still really just in the beginnings of this next kind of Gen, revo Gen AI revolution. I mean, as, as Carolyn said earlier, we're, you know, I've been at companies where we've been dealing, building very deep machine learning and and a lot of building blocks for AI, but the big revolution is really built off of this transformer model and kind of this, the, the gen AI. So what we invest in, in fact, this week we announced, we invested in a company that's um, really taking on NVIDIA and building a semiconductor chip for um, large language models. Um, and so they're taking a swing, these um, Teal Fellows, Harvard dropouts, um, that building a semiconductor built on this transformer model, which is what current large language models are built off of. And if they're right, what this chip will do will allow companies or, or companies to uh, get bandwidth or get GPUs a lot cheaper and faster than what exists currently today. So that's an example of one of the things. That's a real foundational layer. I think there's a lot of picks and shovels right now that need to be built. There's a lot of infrastructure. Um, we invested in a company uh, also, that's, that's building, basically does the work of a back-end engineer um, 
a lot of data modeling, all code, all you know, kind of AI driven. We're invested in a company that's doing uh, AI for medical billing. So what we're seeing right now is just AI being infused into everything. Um, I think of the two to 3,000 pitches we get a year to invest in 12 companies, I'd say 98% of them have AI infused in, in them. Doesn't mean that everyone's building a large language model. That's billions of dollars going into that. And so, again, I think it's infancy. It's a lot of different verticals, different um, industries that are being disrupted. We're seeing a lot of that. And we're seeing a lot of just kind of building blocks. Um, but we're, we're really just scratching the surface. I wouldn't even say we're in the first inning. Well, I'm not a technologist. I work for a government agency. Our perspective is totally different, uh, particularly the EDA, which is a job-based authority. We have focused more on how is it we can support this innovation ecosystem. I mean, as you rightfully pointed out, it's an industry in its nascent stage. There's a lot of growth ahead. We also are trying to recognize what are the areas that one could support, what could we catalyze, uh, and at the same time, uh, put programs and, and initiatives in place to attract companies to the state and give them the resources uh, that allows them to, to uh, grow and create jobs in the state. So let's shift a little bit towards what folks may not necessarily be aware of in the room. The question is, what is an impact of AI people may not be aware of? We could take this in a number of different directions, but I know we've had some conversations about this earlier. Maybe, Ram, we'll start with you. Any thoughts on that? Well, impact. There's not a sector in the world that won't be affected by AI. I think the challenge is not what can you do with it. It's more like how much you want to do within a disciplined environment and, uh, and a structured environment. Um, I think the applications are enormous. Uh, I think the responsibility is really uh, with all the stakeholders, users, corporations, government, to kind of figure out how do we want to use AI and where do we want this AI to go? Because it is, and for every, you know, what people don't realize is every search you do, you're adding more information and knowledge into that AI system, right? After a period of time, knowledge is king and AI could get too far away. So our focus more is. How do we kind of put together an environment, uh, make sure there are companies in here, uh, we, we make sure that uh, most of the innovation centers, all, all the innovation centers we put together have an academic and corporate affiliation to it so that companies can come in here and leverage uh, student body, faculty, additional technology from universities and corporations to partner for uh, beta testing, uh, perhaps even uh, a prospective customer base, strategic alliances, et cetera. Do you think it will outsource human capital? Well, in principle, yes, you could. Uh, but I'm of the, of the opinion that they're going to be, it's years out uh, before humans are taken out, but there are going to be fields and, and uh, professions that are going to be difficult. Take, for instance, um, the uh, uh, the healthcare industry, you just can't take health, you know nurses and surgeons out of the equation and expect AI to step in, robotics to step in and do all of that. So it's it's going to be a process. I mean, uh, there in itself is kind of the rule writing of how do you use AI for let's say HR purposes? Is the AI have does it have all the ring fencing around it so that you don't discriminate or and eliminate biases. So there's a lot ahead. So it's going to be a process. And we're, I think, at the basement level, if that. So we have a long way to go. Yeah, I would just say, um, I mean, listen, I, I don't think, you know, I think humans, is, humans plus AI has, um, I think that's where you get the real kind of net advantage. Um, but I think society historically has adapted to do new technologies. I think the first kind of reaction is this fear factor and this resistance um, and, and this moment of, you know, where people are scared. But I, I, I think over time society adapts and, and this is going to be a moment over the next 20, 30 years of massive adaptation because I think they're going to be parts of people's jobs 
that frankly people hate doing, that AI will allow them to be happier in their work, you know, in their work environment, allow them to do more meaningful stuff, more purposeful stuff, more higher leverage stuff. There are going to be things that maybe we outsourced overseas that, again, we don't need to because, you know, AI can, um, can help someone here and, again, make things more efficient. But I, I think the, the take home is really that um, there's, there's going to be societal impacts. Um, its question is how do we adapt? And we're going to have to adapt because the toothpaste is out of the tube. And now the question is how can society advance more rapidly, more successfully? How can we sell, save more, or solve more problems? I mean, I think, listen, cancer, for example, you talk about health. Cancer has been something we've been trying to solve for decades and haven't solved it. I believe that AI will actually be an accelerant to helping solve cancer, right? Like I think there's technology will help us because we can look at data in ways that we haven't been able to look at it in the past. We can look at tremendous amounts of data sets, tremendous amounts of you know certain type of cancers and patterns to it, and maybe start to identify things that humans weren't able to identify that then allow humans to be able to you know solve cancer, for example. I mean these things I think are all on the come. Um, but again, we're just, you know, we're, we're adopting as society. So if we, we shift for a moment to kind of the ethical side of things, I know, Steve, you don't really want to talk about this as much in our pre-meetings. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Ram. Um, what do you think are the most significant ethical risks associated with advanced AI that we are currently just not addressing adequately? Well, I mean, fundamentally, there are tons of risks, but the way I see risk in this is foremost privacy, right? I mean, you do want to make sure uh, privacy, and at the same time, it's data protection. I mean, there's a lot of personal data. It's, you shouldn't be out there. Um, and, and data, and, and particularly with personal uh, data, it's also the related analytics. What are you doing? Are you trying to impact behavioral change? Um, are you ad addressing, as I pointed out earlier, biases and discrimination? Um, and, and what are the effects of autonomy? I mean, at, and at some point, you just can't uh, push everything to an automized uh, a, a, a environment. You do need some kind of a human interaction at some point. So I think it's, risks are there, but I think, to your point, we will find out more. I don't think we could sit in a room for a week or a year or whatever duration of time and identify every potential risk. So I think as the industry evolves and as things come out, uh, there's going to be correction. But the good news is that a lot of corporations, every corporation is trying to uh, use AI as part of their core operations. And they have already started to put some guardrails around how do we really do use it in a proper and a, a disciplined manner. Scott, I'll jump in. I lied. Okay, so I'll talk about a couple different <laughs> themes that I'm seeing. So one is around, you know, I've, I'm seeing companies, so take banks. Banks, when they decide who to loan out money to, there's a whole, they go through all sorts of models to decide whether you as an individual is someone that they want to loan money to, approve a credit card, on and on and on. Well, what... You know, I, I think in a world of AI, what can happen inherently is there can be biases in that model, right? It can cause the models all of a sudden now, and they're, this is regulated industry, heavily scrutinized, all of a sudden they're not loaning to a certain type of person that they may have loaned to because the AI models are biased. We're seeing companies, startups try and help banks, for example, assess that, attack that, tr um, track that, so that those models don't create inherent biases. We're seeing, um, I think, you know, listen, I think there's going to be a tremendous, there's, there's new cyber companies, uh, cybersecurity companies that are being launched to fight AI fraud. Because today, we know there's, you know, we're constantly under attack, companies are under attack by bots, foreign agents, and so on and so forth that are just, you know, kind of attacking. But now in an AI world, you can do that in orders of magnitude. Um, and you can mimic humans even better than ever. So it's gonna create a whole new wave of cybersecurity and cybersecurity startups to, to really tackle how, um, how AI can attack. My kids, I was sitting on the couch with them last night and they were showing me how 
NBC for the Olympics, I think, is they basically have created kind of a clone of Al Michaels who's going to be doing these daily recaps with his voice in person. So they're going to be, you know, I think one of the things, and we're going to see, I think, in this year's elections is a tremendous amount of deep fake. Um, people that are literally, they're replicating that looks exactly like a person, sounds exactly like a person. It's not that person. So I think, again, there's all these ethical questions or things. And so with, you know, with all these new things that are being built to fool people, there's going to be companies on the other side that help people understand what is human and what's not human. And there's a tremendous amount of ethics that go along with that um, kind of theme and topic. Any quick thoughts on how to balance that innovation with the precaution? I mean, again, I think this is what's great about our society is that there are brilliant people out there that are a lot smarter than I am trying to figure this stuff out, and they will figure it out. So I, I think, you know, historically, again, there's a new innovation. Sometimes it's great for society. Sometimes it's terrible for society. And then there's, on the other side of that, there's someone trying to create something to counter that one way or another. So I, I just think, you know, again, you're, you're going to see, a, you know, it, what's going to be interesting is both, you know, how companies self-govern and then, you know, what, what rules, what, how the government participates and plays in setting boundaries. Um, and, and that's going to be a, a real hot topic over the coming years. I mean, to that end, I mean, if you look at, I think it was October 23, uh, President Biden signed an executive order for around AI that is fundamentally based on uh, protecting people and data and so forth. Um, that's just a start. Uh, there will be other revisions. Uh, similarly, in the EU, there's pending, I think it's still pending, an overall regulatory framework for what AI should do, cannot do, what, and the restrictions. But fundamentally, both of these uh, policies are around for, foremost protecting human rights and human privileges. So I think, to your point, it's going to evolve. We're, there's just no way to capture everything today. Um, and we don't even know what it is we're trying to mitigate. So we started shifting implicitly to the regulatory and policy issues I want to talk about. How can policymakers effectively regulate AI uh, without stifling innovation? So we can, uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. But at the same time, are there specific AI technologies that you just feel should be outright banned? Should be outright banned? Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, of the mindset, again, that it, if, if we start to interfere, listen, our competition, and I think it's really important for us, again, as, you know, here in the United States to understand, China is an incredible threat to this, to, to, to what we do. Why? Because they've been so far ahead, and they're not afraid to, you know, put hundreds of thousands of engineers to build and build AI and how they're using AI. So, you know, I, I think that what we have to understand, and I'm, I'm not one who's political at all, but I, I think we have to understand um, that our competition is global. Our competition is not here. Our competition is with the rest of the world. And if, if we put too many barriers around and don't let the markets work itself out and let companies govern, again, with stipulations, you know, there's going to need to be some um, some frameworks. Um, if we get overly restrictive, we're going to lose. We're going to lose kind of long term globally. And so I, I just think, um, you know, one example: how data is used. How data is used. You know, that right now, you know, New York Times I think is suing because they're the LMs. You know, they're claiming the LMs have you know stolen their data. You know, that that would be an area where okay, it may make sense to add some regulation, for example. What is considered public data, what's not, how do we use that? Um, so I think they're gonna be pockets, but if, if we try and get too restrictive, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna lose the battle and, and, and the, the race long term, and uh, we'll get left behind. I couldn't agree more. I mean, regulations are great, but ready to manage in a, like overbearing regulations also stifle growth, 
innovation. Um, I mean, take example of um, all the sort of uh, uh, tariffs that we've imposed on Chinese imports. What people are now realizing is, yes, it has curbed some of the imports from China, but at the same time, to your point, it's a global village. We are all, the supply chains are global, and uh, American manufacturers are also paying a price for it because the supply chain costs have gone up because our dependency is on suppliers whom we have bans on. So all of a sudden, the cost of raw material has gone through the roof as well. So it has to be, uh, there should be a framework, I think, but fundamentally, policy should be around what's the most important thing we're trying to safeguard, which is, to your point, data, okay? What data can you not use? And if you do use it, how do you use it? It's very similar to our HIPAA regulations. You know, you, know, you can't disclose medical records to one another. Great, that makes sense. You can't walk around going, well, so-and-so has this, so-and-so did that. Um, so I think it's, it, it, it basically says you cannot disclose medical uh, data. That's enough. And then the industry figures out how to kind of work within the construct as opposed to trying to prescribe all the way down to detail what regulation should be. Let's talk about further development in the space and limitations thereof. Can, can we talk about the limitations of current AI technologies and how these limitations might influence the areas of what the title suggests, AI that we are avoiding? I mean, I, I could jump in there on, so, <laughs> There is thing in order for you know the the acceleration and advancement in AI. Um, again, it comes back to we need electricity, we need power. We don't have enough power uh, right now to be able to supply, to be able to advance, uh, you know, the models as 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 much uh, with the amount of energy that they're consuming today, right? So we have a strain on our energy ecosystem. There will be a strain if we don't figure out how to get more power. There's gonna be, Carolyn and I were just talking about this, right? Um, an explosion of data centers. Uh, chips, right? We need to be able to build, chips are the, going to be the things that allow us to consume the amount of data. And, and the amount of data that's being built into these LMs, so if you go, you know, you're using any, you know, whether it's Google or ChatGPT or Anthropic, whatever models, um, the amount of data that they're using is just astronomical, and it's going to grow. You know, whatever Moore's law is, you know, how it doubles every 18 months. It's growing. You know, every 12 to 18 months. So, you know, I think this is why we invest in a semiconductor company. There's going to need to be more chips. There's going to be need to be more manufacturing. It's why, you know, the global supply chain and, and the reliance on companies like TSMC to build these and manufacture these, you know. There's a bottleneck there, and so they only have so much capacity. So again, I think a lot of the infrastructure is going to limit how quickly we can move, which is why there's a lot of investment going into a lot of the infrastructure. I don't know. So, so you weren't, excuse me one second, you weren't in any of our prep sessions? That was the theme. Power, 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 but go ahead. I mean, just to add, uh, add to that, I think just to get put into perspective, an average data center, depending on the size, let's say a large data center uses 150 megawatt hours of energy a year, and that's a lot. When we talk about AI and AI servers, um, you're talking a, a factor of seven to 10 times power usage. So the same data center that has been supported with 150 megawatts of power would need a gigawatt of power, right, now. The challenge is not getting power, it's more what is the source of power? Is it clean energy? Uh, if so, uh, how do you generate that kind of power? What technology do you use? Uh, nuclear is still deemed clean energy, but we're dialing down on the number of nukes in the country and they're aging. And what uh, the bigger challenge of depending entirely on nuclear is that any time you dedicate a nuclear uh, uh, power generation to a data center that's deemed uh, uh, behind the meter. What does that mean? So when governments do computations of what is a clean energy generation where, versus uh, non-clean or, 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 or traditional generation, taking that new power, uh, the, the new power 
uh, off from the grid says all of a sudden you have that much more of non-renewable energy. That's a challenge. Uh, infrastructure is really, really uh, important. And um, part of what we're focusing on at the EDA right now is we'd love to have, we have data centers in the state. Uh, we know some of these data centers are going to go after the AI sector. There's going to be power requirement. How do we kind of support that power, right? And, and not only that, if we're going to have data centers and we want more of them, we also have to worry about other states that have a cost differential in power. You know, um, in the Northeast tends to be at least 20% higher than other markets. Um, and in some markets, it's as much as 50%, 100% higher. With that said, power is important for sure. The other way to look at it is, to your point of, of chips, over the years, there's been, yes, you've developed chips, but the next sort of the generation of chips also have been addressing power consumption at the chip level, right? If you reduce the power consumption at processing, then you're also going to, by default, use less power and thereby dependency on the grid goes down a bit, right? So there are many ways to tackle this problem, and I think across the sort of the, the, the uh, universe of companies from hardware to software and applications are going to try and find a solution. We have to. So there's a lot more questions I love to ask, but time is up. Um, I do this on every panel before we're done. What do you want this group to take away? And you may have already discussed this in your prior group, but may maybe we'll start with, with Ram. Mariana, you'll have to wait a minute. But any, what do you want the group to take away? What are your parting shots with respect to AI, and specifically the AI we're avoiding? Well, I will let him be the closer as he, well, he started. So with that said, um, I think AI is a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity going forward. It'll be with us for whatever decades and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're at a really early stage, and I think uh, like any other technology we have adopted over the years and in the past, we will find a way to use it constructively and productively uh, I mean, take blockchain, took a little adoption, but blockchain gave us quite a bit. Uh, what people don't realize is we use debit cards without a blink. Um, the biggest challenge with debit cards, for it to become mainstay in everyone's wallet, took 18 years. And, it, and, and think about the adoption rate of AI and other technologies at a blisteringly much faster pace. So we're adopting technology faster, we're, I think, getting more responsible about how to use that technology faster. And, but it's exciting. I mean, it, what is not exciting about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, now's the time to be learning. And I think there's a lot to learn. And, and I, I wouldn't be scared because everyone's learning together. So I, I think those that embrace, adopt, learn, and surround, you know, hopefully surrounded by the other great people, I think you're gonna get ahead. I think if you fear it uh, and you're kind of rejecting it um, and you're not really kind of being a student of what's going on, then it may get more challenging as time goes on. Steve, thanks for filling in. Ram, really appreciate it. Well, thank you, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you all.